committee will come to order, and I would remind all of our members and guests that we are doing today only opening statements. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome. Uh, today we're going to work through the opening statements. Tomorrow we will start and consider and finish the following legislation. H.R. 452, the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act. H.R. 3309, the Federal Communication Commission Process Reform Act. And H.R. 3310, the Federal Communications Commission Consolidated Reporting Act. I firmly believe there are common themes that unite the work of our six subcommittees and the broad range of issues that they encompass. All six subcommittees are focused on solutions to support economic growth and job creation. They are all working to reduce the size and scope of government, eliminating wasteful spending and standing up for the taxpayers. And they are all working to protect individuals, families and communities. One way that we can achieve all of these goals is through sound process. You see, what matters is not just what government does, but how we do it. And that is a common thread among the bills that we're considering this week, whether it's decisions about how to protect Medicare patients while reducing the cost of the program, or whether it's how the FCC administers telecommunications policy, these practices should be open and accountable. And that's precisely what this legislation is designed to accomplish. Last week, the Health Subcommittee approved H.R. 452, the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act, with bipartisan support. This bill repeals one of the more ominous parts of the President's massive health reform legislation, the IPAB, which was established in Section 3403 of PIPACA, a clear-cut example of the contrast between the two fundamentally different views of how to reform the Medicare program and preserve it for future generations. President's health care law says that cutting $575 billion for Medicare to fund new health entitlements and that then allowing a 15-member panel of unelected bureaucrats to decide what health care goods and services are valuable is the way to reform the program. We strongly disagree. We believe that health care decisions belong in the hands of patients and doctors rather than an unaccountable panel of government-appointed experts. The goal is to reform Medicare and preserve it for future generations, and as I said at the beginning, how you do it does matter. IPAB is not the way to protect Medicare, and I'm pleased to see us working in a bipartisan fashion to repeal it. Repealing IPAB is one way to restore accountability and openness. FCC process reform is another. When we took over the majority in the House of Representatives, the GOP transition team, led by our own Chairman Walden, took a fresh look at how the House was run. And I'm pr proud to say that our committee, with more than 100 hearings so far, has led by example in showing that a deliberative, accountable process leads to quality results. Given the FCC's role as the federal regulator of the communications and technology sector, one of the largest economic drivers, even in this sluggish national economy, it is imperative that the FCC operate in a transparent and accountable manner that encourages job creation, investment, and innovation. Mr. Walden's FCC Process Reform Act does that by taking the best ideas from both sides of the aisle. <clears throat> President Obama and his Jobs Council recommended that independent agencies conduct cost-benefit analysis, this is, and former Commissioner Copps recommended improving deliberations among commissioners. State commissions recommended more transparency in the FCC's rulemaking process and small businesses reported shot clocks so that they know when their petitions will be acted on. The FCC process reform accomplishes all of these recommendations and more, building on the work of Chairman Janikowski to make the FCC home to good government process. And just as we should be using good process to adopt new rules, we also need to ensure that legacy regulations and reports are not hampering investment and innovation. Mr. Scalise's FCC Consolidated Reporting Act is a step in the right direction there, consolidating eight separate reports on the communications marketplace in a, into a single report. By looking at the marketplace as a whole rather than in traditional silos, the FCC and the American public will be better informed about existing competition and any barriers that may be preventing small businesses from investing in creating jobs. So that uh, concludes my opening statement. I will yield to the ranking member of the full committee, gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for an opening statement for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Today, the committee begins its markup of three bills. Two of these are terrible bills that are destined to die in the Senate. We should be considering legislation that will create jobs and strengthen our economy, 
not wasting our time with these one house bills. The first bill is H.R. 452. It's part of the Republican political attack on Medicare and the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is working. This historic law is driving down health care costs and increasing health care benefits for all Americans. As a result of health reform, four million seniors now have significantly lower prescription drug costs. More than 80 million Americans are now receiving expanded preventive care. More than two million young adults now have health insurance coverage on their parents' policies, and children who previously were denied insurance due to pre-existing medical conditions are enrolled in coverage. And health care costs are coming down. Medicare will cost $100 billion less in 2020 than previously estimated, due in part to the reforms Congress enacted. Health insurance premiums are being held in check by new rate review and medical loss ratio requirements. Yet despite this record of success, House Republicans want to repeal health reform, end Medicare's guarantee of coverage for seniors, and eliminate consumer protections for people who are uninsured or ill-served by our insurance market. For the last year, House Republicans have been claiming erroneously that we cannot afford to maintain Medicare's promise to seniors. Yet today they will take a vote that will cost Medicare over $2 billion. And they have identified no way to pay for the costs they are adding to Medicare. This is the height of hypocrisy. House Republicans say we can't afford Medicare, yet they want to eliminate one of the innovations in the Affordable Care Act that keeps Medicare costs under control. The Republican master plan for Medicare is to end the guarantee of coverage and shift more costs onto seniors and people with disabilities. H.R. 452 is part of this Republican assault on Medicare. It would repeal the Medicare Independent Payment Advisory Board, which serves as a backstop to help Medicare to, to help uh, keep Medicare affordable for seniors. The second bill, H.R. 3309, is called the Federal Communications Process Reform Act, but it would dis disable the FCC, not reform it. Independent experts have told us this legislation would tie the agency in knots and subject it to endless legal challenges. One expert said industry lawyers would have a, quote, field day, end quote, if this bill became law. Others said it could take 15 years of litigation for the courts to clarify the meaning of the new requirements in the bill. There are a few provisions in H.R. 3309 that make sense. One is a bipartisan proposal by Representative Shimkus and Eshoo that would allow commissioners to talk privately with each other about FCC policies. Uh, I suggested to Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden that we should divide H.R. 3309 into two bills, one that could get bipartisan support and be enacted into law, and one with partisan provisions that would die in the Senate. They rejected this suggestion, which dooms the entire package and raises serious questions about why are we doing this bill at all. The American people are getting frustrated with Congress. They want us to stop posturing and start addressing their needs but this markup is yet another squandered opportunity, I very much regret to say, but I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back his time. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Florida for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank Mr. Barton for the opportunity to do so. My colleagues, as chairman of the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee, I have pushed agencies to eliminate regulatory uncertainty that stifles innovation and hampers small businesses. I believe the reforms embodied in H.R. 3309 and H.R. 3310 will simply promote this goal by bringing more transparency and accountability into the Federal Communication Commission's process. These bills are an important first step towards updating the 1996 Telecommunications Act. 
Since June, Chairman Walden and I have looked into the number of backlogs pending at the FCC. As of July, my colleagues, the FCC had 5,328 petitions, more than a million consumer complaints, and 4,185 license applications that have been gathering dust for more than two years. While FCC data we received in January indicates that the agency is making headway in closing some of these dockets and addressing industry applications and petitions, much more work remains to be done. I would also like to point out that not all regulations are created equal. When the FCC eliminates rules that have had no effect of law, such as a fairness doctrine, but then implements new regulations such as net neutrality, it appears that the agency is taking one step forward and ten steps back. The problem at the FCC today are not the result of one chairman at the Commission. I understand that. Instead, this problem has persisted for many years. Thus, while the FCC chairman is working to clear some regulatory backlog, only Congress can permanently fix the process at the FCC. Today, Congress is doing just that with H.R. 3309 and H.R. 3310, and I fully support passage of both bills. The last bill today is the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act, H.R. 452, would repeal the Independent Payment Advisory Board, IPAP, which was created in the President's failed health care bill. IPAD is like SGR on steroids. Rather than fixing the SGR problem in the health care law, Democrats were happy to allow continued cuts to physician payments and then double down on further cuts through IPAP. IPAP is a group of 15 unelected bureaucrats who would save Medicare by making draconian cuts to provider payments. Democrats wanted to control the future cost of Medicare by giving unelected bureaucrats the power to cut payments to hospitals and to doctors. If Democrats were serious about controlling costs within Medicare, they would have looked at reforming and modernizing the Medicare program. Instead, they punish doctors and hospitals, and ultimately in danger are seniors who depend on these doctors and hospitals. We need to repeal IPAP just as we need to repeal this failed health care law. If IPAP is similar to class, it is another sham savings in the failed health care law. So I'm a proud co-sponsor repealing IPAP, and I look forward to its quick passage. And with that, I yield back. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the uh, A Chairman Emeritus, uh, gentleman from the great state of Michigan, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes for nominee statement. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon. Thank you for the recognition. I always appreciate your courtesy and kindness. With all respect, Mr. Chairman, the committee finds itself wasting time again. The bills we will consider won't create new jobs or reduce the deficit. It goes without saying that the Senate won't take them up and that the President would probably veto them if they ever get down there to the White House. Concerning H.R. 452, it's clear to me that my good Republican colleagues won't let earlier decisions stand. Instead, they're trying to repeal in whole or in part a law that can significantly improve the quality of health care in this country while reducing spending. This strikes me as particularly curious, given all the talk of late about the importance of cutting spending. H.R. 3309's provenance is similarly dubious. While I appreciate the efforts of my good friends on the Republican side in reaching out to me on the bill, too little has been done to satisfy me that it won't create more problems than it will solve. In the final analysis, crippling an agency like the FCC is no way to reform it, even though I agree with most in this room that that agency very much needs reform. Mr. Chairman, we would be wise indeed to spend our time on matters that really help our constituents and address the significant problems the nation confronts. We need to pass legislation that creates jobs, improves Americans' quality of life, encourages new, innovative businesses to grow. Sadly, none of the bills before us today come close to doing anything with those concerns. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. You are always most gracious. And I look forward to working with you and all of my colleagues in the future. And as always, I will be hoping that the chance presents itself. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back would recognize another chairman emeritus of the committee, gentleman from the good state of Texas, 
Mr. Barton. I don't think there is a bad state of Texas. Well, it's either the great state or a good state, but you're from a great state. state. All right. Very good state. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for beginning the uh, opening statements on the markup of uh, these three bills. As you know, uh, November a year ago, the American people spoke very, very, very clearly when they studied their dissatisfaction with the federal government and gave the Republican Party that you and I are a member of the majority back in the House of Representatives. Today we're going to consider 45, I mean 452, the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act, which would repeal the Independent Payment Advisory Board, or IPAP. In 1997, Congress created the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, MedPAC, to provide recommendations to Congress on issues relating to Medicare. MedPAC issues two-year reports two reports a year to Congress on the suggested changes to Medicare. Congress has the responsibility of acting or not acting on these changes. I guess this wasn't enough because the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act created yet another bureaucracy, this IPAB, to take on a strikingly similar role. There are differences, though. IPAB is supposed to consist of 15 unelected, unaccountable so-called experts who were tasked with reducing Medicare spending. IPAB board members, though, do receive $165,300 a year as a salary. To date, two years after the enactment of the law that created IPAB, the President has yet to nominate anyone to serve on the board. If no nominations are named, or if no nominations are approved, in January of 2014, IPAB will be con constituted with the Secretary of Health and Human Services making the decisions of the board. No one here will dispute that Medicare needs to be reformed. However, creating another federal board doesn't appear to me to be the answer. Because of limitations on spending cuts, most IPAB cuts would likely be to Medicare Part B and Part D, which cover medical procedures and drugs. Surveys indicate that many doctors already limit the number of Medicare patients they see because the payment rates are too low. If IPAB makes more cuts and more doctors refuse to see Medicare patients, the more seniors will have less options with regard to their own medical care. And unlike MedPAC, which is in place to make recommendations to the Congress, IPAB's recommendations are binding unless Congress acts to overturn them. This is simply not the way to go, and it's, it's exercising the legislative authority of the Congress at the executive level, in my opinion. We do need to have serious Medicare reforms, there's no question about that, but IPAB is not the way to do it, and so I'm very happy that the subcommittee decided to ax IPAB, and I hope the full committee does too. In terms of the other two bills, we're going to consider 3309, the FCC Process Reform Act, and 3310, the FCC Consolidated Reporting Act. Both bills seek to reform the outdated policies of the FCC and I strongly support both of these initiatives. I have been a proponent for many years of reforming the FCC. In the last Congress, I introduced legislation with, Chris, with uh, Cliff Stearns to reform the FCC. The two bills before us today incorporate many of the reforms that Congressman Stearns and I recommended last year. I have reviewed these bills. They've, many of the recommendations that I put in my earlier bills are in them, and some that that uh, I recommended in terms of reforms to these bills have also been incorpor incorporated. When the chairman of the FCC, Mr. Janikowski himself admits that we need to reform the FCC, I think it is time to act, and hopefully we'll do it in a bipartisan fashion. With that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your leadership on these three issues. Look forward to uh, working tomorrow to mark the bills up, and I do yield back. Chair would recognize the uh, ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, a gentleman from uh, New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we will continue moving forward to repeal the Independent Payment Advisory Board, better known as IPAB. Last week during the Subcommittee on Health Markup, I voted in favor of its repeal, but I was not happy with the messages coming from the other side of the aisle. Unfortunately, my Republican colleagues are using the upcoming second anniversary of the Affordable Care Act to deface it and to continue their game of repealing the law piece by piece. 
My opposition to IPAB stems from my strong belief that Congress must stop ceding legislative power to the executive branch. Like other independent commissions, IPAB encroaches upon legislative authority and should not play a legislative role other than on a recommendatory basis. It is not the job of an unelected or unaccountable commission to make decisions on health care policy for Medicare beneficiaries. But let me tell you what IPAB is not. It is not an attack on the fundamental foundations of Medicare, which is exa exactly what is being proposed by Republicans. Republicans want to turn Medicare into a voucher program, an attempt to control spending by shifting health care costs onto seniors and people with disabilities. Under the Republican plan, health care costs would continue to rise and seniors would pay at least $6,400 more per year for their Medicare, according to the CBO. Under the Republican plan, Medicare is turned over to private insurance companies who can ration care. The distinction is clear. The Republican plan for Medicare eliminates Medicare's guaranteed benefits and limits on cost sharing and premiums, turning these decisions over to insurance companies. I would ask my Republican colleagues, do you seriously expect me to believe that you want to protect Medicare and seniors when every one of you voted to end Medicare as we know it? Your budget turns the program and millions of seniors over to the private insurers with no accountability. And I am beginning to see a pattern here because it is clear whose side the Republicans are on. It is that of the insurance companies and the special interests, not the seniors and the disabled. I wanted to take a minute to explain ver very clearly what repealing the ACA would mean for patients. It would mean that seniors and people with disabilities who are receiving significant out-of-pocket relief for high drug costs would see those savings evaporate. It would mean that the approximately 86 million Americans who have received expanded coverage of some preventive services with no cost sharing due to the ACA would once again face financial hurdles for these services, a disincentive to get needed care. It is no secret that for years insurance companies have squeezed consumers, raising premiums to pay for increasingly exorbitant CEO salaries and profits. The ACA is putting a stop to that practice, requiring insurers to justify premium hikes and thereby protecting consumers. Already we have seen states denying unreasonable and unjustifiable premium increases. There are 2.5 million more young adults who have health insurance coverage thanks to a provision in the health law allowing young adults to remain on their parents' health insurance until age 26. The law has given us strong tools to fight fraud. In 2011 alone, the Department of Justice covered more than $5.6 billion in fraud government-wide. So if my Republican colleagues want to continue to debate the Affordable Care Act's benefits, then I say bring it on. Uh, I don't think really iPad uh, is a significant part of the ACA. The ACA uh, stands on its own without IPAB, and I don't want to see IPAB used as a reason for ACA's repeal. Mr. Chairman, I say that, uh, that this is likely to come up on the second anniversary because I'm assuming that this week we're going to vote in full committee and then we have a break and when we come back uh, it will probably be on the floor, which is the very week of the second anniversary uh, of the Affordable Care Act. And I just want to say that I think the Affordable Care Act is working and my opposition to uh, IPAB in no way um, indicates uh, where we are going with the ACA. The ACA is doing a good job and as it kicks in we will see more and more people that will have health insurance. I think we will get close to universal coverage as the exchanges come on, the tax benefits are available for those who need it, and we see an, uh, an increased expansion of Medicare. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair would recognize the Chairman of the Health Subcommittee, um, Dr. Pitt. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I limit my remarks to H.R. 452, the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act of 2011, which repeals the Independent Payment Advisory Board from the President's health care law. The purpose of IPAB is to reduce Medicare's per capita growth rate. Clearly, Medicare growth is an out of control on an out of, out of control trajectory that endangers the solvency and continued existence of the program. IPAB, however, is not the solution. Fifteen unelected bureaucrats nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate will be paid $165,300 a year to serve six year terms on the board. If Medicare growth goes over an arbitrary target, the Board is required to submit a proposal to Congress that would reduce Medicare's growth rate. 
these recommendations will automatically go into effect unless Congress passes legislation that would achieve the same amount of savings. The Board has the power to make binding decisions about Medicare policy with no requirement for public comment prior to issuing their recommendations, and individuals and providers will have no recourse against the Board as its decisions are not subject to appeal or judicial review. This is hardly a model of transparency and accountability. To be perfectly clear, the Affordable Care Act prohibits IPAB from changing Medicare eligibility requirements, from cutting Medicare benefits, and from increasing premiums or copayments on beneficiaries. They are also prohibited from rationing care, and rationing is a term not defined in Federal law. So what is the problem? If IPAB can't make cuts in any of the areas I just mentioned, one of the only places left to cut from are provider reimbursements. Medicare already reimburses below the cost of providing services, and we are already seeing doctors refusing to take new Medicare patients or Medicare patients at all because they cannot afford to absorb the losses. According to an American Medical Association survey, current reimbursement rates have already led 17 percent of all doctors, including 31 percent of primary care physicians, to restrict the number of Medicare patients in their practices. Any additional provider cuts will lead to fewer Medicare providers, and that means that beneficiary access will suffer. Seniors will be forced to wait in longer and longer lines to be seen by an ever-shrinking pool of providers or have to travel longer and longer distances to find a provider willing to see them. Even HHS Secretary Sebelius admitted that IPAB cuts could hurt seniors. Ask in a 2011 House hearing if IPAB ordered payment reductions could mean longer waits for dialysis services Secretary Sebelius replied, quote, as you know, any cut in services could mean huge reductions in care that seniors would have the opportunity to receive, end quote. IPAB may not be able to directly ration care, but cutting provider reimbursements to the point that doctors can no longer see Medicare patients will result in de facto rationing. I'm proud that this bill has bipartisan co-sponsors and was favorably reported out of the Health Subcommittee with support from both sides of the aisle. We need to put Medicare on a firm financial footing. IPAB is not the way to do it. I urge my colleagues to support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The Chair would recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, uh, Mrs. Christensen, for an opening. You might want to turn that mic on. Is it not working? You can come on over to our side. <laughs> no, no. Sorry about that. We'll make sure that it's working tomorrow. <laughs> okay, got it. So thank you, Chairman Upton uh, uh, and Ranking Member Waxen for the opportunity to comment on the two bills before the committee today. I do support H.R. 452, the repeal of the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And as a physician, one of the very few groups that could be adversely affected by it, I cannot support IPAB because it not, not only is cutting reimbursements only to providers and health care facilities not the best solution, but doing so will disproportionately and detrimentally affect the most vulnerable patients. Further, as crafted in the law, IPAB would not be effective in tackling real solutions for Medicare solvency, and it contributes proportionately little to the projected cost savings in Medicare. The Affordable Care Act, even without the IPAB, 
is the largest deficit reducing bill passed in decades. It has significantly strengthened the Medicare program and is projected to cut its increases in per capita spending by more than half. And that's without counting the savings that will be realized from prevention, which I believe will be significant. Further, the Tri Caucus worked with the White House and congressional leadership to ensure that health equity was a core goal of the Affordable Care Act, with estimates of the direct and indirect costs of health disparities in just over a four-year period being $1.24 trillion, the deficit reduction projections in ACA would even be greater. So in addition to the fact that the Independent Payment Advisory Board usurps congressional authority, it's an idea looking for a reason to exist, and there is none. And even the IPAB supporters say that it's a flawed entity. On H.R. 3309, all this bill would do is hamstring the FCC for years to come and thwart their ability to protect the public interest in transactions and other issues under their authority. Chairman Janikowski has been moving the FCC in the right direction regarding process. Under his leadership, the Commission has taken significant steps to rem remedy many of the problems identified in 3309 and to comply with Executive Order 13579. I see no reason to apply this unique regulatory straitjacket to the FCC and every reason, especially the protection of consumers, not to. And so I oppose H.R. 3309 and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for Thank an opening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I support all three of the bills before us today and urge my colleagues to support quick passage. H.R. 452, the Medicare Decisions Accountability Act of 2011, uh, will repeal the Independent Payment Advisory Board created in the President's health care bill, which I believe or concern that it limits health care options and access to treatments and services for seniors and sharing Mr. Pallone's view uh, that we are ceding too much power to regulatory agencies. It was extremely unfortunate that rather than strengthening Medicare, uh, we put our Medicare uh, seniors in trouble. Rather than address the future financial issues surrounding Medicare, the President's plan rationed care through an unelected, unaccountable board of bureaucrats. H.R. 3309, the Federal Communications Process Reform Act, uh, is absolutely necessary. The Federal Communications Commission Consolidated Reporting Act are about three things, transparency, modernization, and regulatory certainty. Almost everything in this bill was actually stated as necessary by the chairman. I would also like to acknowledge the work that Chairman Janikowski has done in improving some of the process issues that have plagued the Commission, sui spani on his own. However, it is more important than ever that we make these statutory changes now. Doing so will ensure openness and transparency for the public while making sure that only the best practices will continue from one administration to the next. And I thank the Chair and yield back. Thank you. The Chair would recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for an opening statement. Does that not work either? Sorry. We'll have these checked out for tomorrow. And the two mics down here aren't working. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have shared some of my concerns over the Independent Payment Advisory Board, IPAB, since its inclusion in the Affordable Care Act. I understand the views of those who believe that IPAB undermines congressional authority to determine critical matters of health policy. And at this time, I am not convinced that IPAB is the right way to achieve Medicare savings. But Mr. Chairman, H.R. 452 is nothing more than a partisan messaging tool designed to exploit legitimate concerns about IPAB as part of the majority's broader indictment of the entire Affordable Care Act. Instead of working in a bipartisan manner to try to address IPAB's problems in a serious way, this bill offers a diagnosis with no cure. I'm especially concerned that this repeal effort offers no alternatives to account for the cost control measures that IPAB, while not perfect, was designed to implement. 
nor does it specify the necessary offsets for the $2.4 billion increase in Medicare spending this bill would create. This bill exemplifies the majority's continuous drumbeat to repeal the ACA in a piecemeal fashion, fearful that Americans may have a chance to fully realize its tremendous benefits. I have seen firsthand the very real benefits Americans, particularly our nation's seniors, are already experiencing thanks to the ACA. Medicare Advantage premiums declined roughly 7% over 2011, while enrollment increased by 10%. Furthermore, thanks to the Medicare prescription drug discounts in the ACA, 3.6 million seniors saved a total of $2.1 billion last year. These are but a few examples that clearly point to the fact that health care reform is working. And while I remain concerned about IPAB, I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation. Lastly, I believe there are some real reforms that the FCC must undertake, but I am concerned that H.R. 3309 is a blatant overreach that would severely tie the hands of the FCC for years and limit its ability to properly conduct any meaningful review, oversight, and action on our nation's telecom policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will confine my, mo uh, my remarks simply to H.R. 452 because the Independent Payment Advi Advisory Board really encompasses all that is wrong with the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. We've heard reference made to the fact that power devolves from the legislative to the executive branch. But really, let's call this what it is. It's a direct assault on the Constitution of the United States. Article 1, Section 1 says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a House and a Senate. But nowhere in there is there any mention of this board that will, by its very nature, restrict access to care for seniors, not just this year, not just next year, but literally for every decade yet to come. Now, it's one of the many components of this very bad law that throws the government right into the middle of the doctor-patient relationship. In the Independent Payment Advisory Board, we find this panel that's not elected, selected by the president, it's not accountable, and it will have power to influence prices, reimbursement, and access. And I may say it will in, uh, influence prices without having to regard cost in any way. Not only are they influencing Medicare, but given that private insurance use Medicare as a benchmark for their own payment changes, this board will have far-reaching implications beyond Medicare for all of our nation's doctors. You know, two years ago, this entire law was sold to the United, people of the United States of America as a way to hold down costs. Two years later, does anybody, does anybody still believe that fantasy? And certainly, the Independent Payment Advisory Board will be unable to lower costs. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation issue brief stated that the Independent Payment Advisory Board is unlikely to generate savings through long-term delivery system reforms. In addition, because of limitations on what the board can cut, the majority of spending reduction is going to come from Part D and Part D provider fees, fees that doctors are becoming increasingly unable to provide their services, and now the board is going to decide they're of even less value. So the answer presented is to squeeze doctors out of providing services. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like rationing. The future of American health care should not be left up to this panel of experts or more worrisome to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And that is why I support the full repeal of the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And I thank the chairman for bringing this legislation to the committee. I yield back. Chairman yields back. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrich, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ranking member Waxman was quoted recently in the Hill newspaper as saying, IPAB is nothing more than a useful backstop to impose some discipline on Congress to stop out-of-control Medicare spending. Well, I agree with Mr. Waxman. Congress needs to stop out-of-control Medicare spending. And Congress needs to be honest with the American people about the Medicare program. It will be bankrupt as early as 2016 and at the latest 2024. The longer we wait to save the Medicare program, the more at risk our seniors will be. Making it harder for our seniors to find a doctor or the best treatments available is not, 
I repeat, not meaning for reform. It's IPAB. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to support its repeal and join me in pushing Congress to truly save the Medicare program. Our seniors cannot wait for reform any longer. In addition, uh, Mr. Chairman, I also urge support for H.R. 3309 as well as H.R. 3310. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise is recognized for only a Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you bringing up this legislation that we're going to be taking up for votes tomorrow. Uh, the three bills are bills that I all strongly support. I want to start by talking about uh, the bill to repeal the IPAP. Uh, the Independent Patients Advisory Board is a, is a group of 15 unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. that will have the ability to ration health care under the President's health care law. I think as most Americans hear more details of the, of the entire law, uh, there are things that they don't know what it's going to do, but of all the things that they hear it's going to do, they don't like it. Every small business I talk to uh, talks about the problems they're having hiring workers uh, directly related to the problems being caused by the president's health care law. And IPAB is one of those components of this law that needs to be repealed. The whole law needs to be repealed. But at least as we're going through highlighting these individual components and trying to repeal individual components, uh, this is one uh, that, that stands out as, as a very offensive board uh, that people feel not only uh, violates many of the tenets that, that President Obama promised when he said, if you like what you have, you can keep it. I uh, said that there would be no rationing. Uh, but yet you look at what this, this board of 15 unelected bureaucrats would be able to do. Uh, they literally would be able to get in the middle of decisions between doctors and patients. And that goes to the heart of health care. Health care should be uh, the the decisions that are made by a doctor in consultation uh, with the patient where the patient works with the doctor to decide what's best for them, not having some unelected bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. making those decisions for the doctor and the patient. Uh, so I'm glad that we're going to be bringing this bill up as a co-sponsor. It's one that we need to pass. I also encourage my colleagues to support my bill, H.R. 3310, the FCC Consolidated Reporting Act, as well as Chairman Walden's bill, H.R. 3309, the FCC Process Reform Bill, uh, which I'm proud to be a co-sponsor. These bills actually go to the heart of making reforms to the FCC that are, are very important. If you look at the stacks of reports uh, well over this high that, uh, that individual, the FCC and individual companies are required to re uh, re uh, file every year, uh, so many of these reports are obsolete before they're even filed. Uh, many of the report dates are missed because so many of the reports uh, aren't, even, uh, aren't even valid anymore. There's still a report uh, dealing, uh, dealing with telecommunications methods like the, uh, the telegraph. We don't need a, a report on telegraph competitiveness anymore. We need to look at all of these reports and repeal uh, the existing reports and go to a consolidating report format so that we can truly look at the marketplace in the way that it's operating today. H.R. 3310 also acknowledges that we have a fiscal crisis in this country. That means we must find ways to do more with less. And by asking the FCC to report every other year rather than a year, this committee can promote more efficient, less costly, and less intrusive government. Because the reality is, as these reports come out, the compilation of these reports uh, takes countless hours of time uh, that can be better well spent creating jobs in the private sector. Re reshaping the Commission's mission and the mission of other agencies we oversee is a critical part of dealing with that reality. Ultimately, the practical effect of the bill uh, that we filed is going to be on job creators in this country so that they can use their resources to do what they do best, and that's putting people to work. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to pass these important common sense bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Harper, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Medicare is a crucial program for our nation's seniors, and its viability must be maintained. There is no question, Medicare must be modernized in order to avoid the program's projected financial shortfalls. House Republicans have advanced a budget blueprint to place this program, as well as other efficient supports that guard our nation's underprivileged, on sound financial footings for both today's and future retirees. Contrast that with what happened with Obamacare when this White House cut Medicare benefits $523 billion 
and robbed Congress of its governing authority through the creation of a 15-member panel to be handpicked by the administration. The Unconstitutional Independent Payment Advisory Board is further proof of the so-called Affordable Care Act's unprecedented power grab and adds weight to my belief that this law is nothing short of politics above economics. This is why I not only support the full repeal of this burdensome act, but I am a co-sponsor of H.R. 452, which I will support in today's markup. Before I close, I would like to note that the success of America's communications industry is reliant on a fluid process at the Federal Communications Commission. I believe that H.R. 3309 and H.R. 3310 will help streamline the FCC and ensure a bright future for our communications marketplace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Chair now would recognize the very patient gentleman from the good state of Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will also restrict my remarks to H.R. 452. I mean, there's common ground between Republicans and Democrats that Medicare is unsustainable in its current form. Uh, and I'm a doctor, so I'm particularly passionate about this because I realize the importance of this program to patients. If you pay physicians less than their cost to see a patient, then inevitably that's going to hurt access. Now, we know that Medicare is going bankrupt. It's going to cost about $570 billion this year, growing annually at about 5.6 percent through to uh, 2021. And so this is an important issue. And since almost half of Medicare's funding comes from general appropriations, its growth directly contributes to the deficit. Indeed, as we all know, if nothing is done to address this, the entitlements of Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and interest on our debt will consume every federal tax dollar by 2025, which is in 14 years. Inevitably, if this occurs, Medicare will fail. Patients will suffer. We can't allow this to happen. Now, we can all acknowledge the problem, but we may differ on the solutions. President Obama's health care plan created something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board, or IPAP, which is, as people have said, an unelected board of bureaucrats who will have the ability to set rates paid to Medicare providers. Now, it's interesting. In this sense, it's an updated version of the sustained growth rate, another centrally planned economy mechanism by which to restrict cost. Now, in IPAP, it sets a budget, then cuts provider reimbursements until the budget target is achieved. SGR did something similar. And SGR has not restrained health care costs, but is faulted for decreasing seniors' access to primary care physicians. Now, the faith that the IPAP will be different than SGR brings to mind Samuel Johnson's quote regarding second marriages. They are the triumph of hope over experience. Indeed, with a clearer eye than the administration, the chief actuary for the CBO says that the savings from IPAP will be zero. Now, that said, apologists for the president's health care law see, see nonetheless that restricting payments by fiat will actually reduce waste. Uh, well, no. That's that, that uh, in reality, IPAP is severely restricted in areas where it can address waste. It can't recommend rationing, it can't raise revenues, it can't, decrease, it can't increase premiums, it can't increase cost sharing, inevitably it will cut payments to physicians. And we have learned that if you do so, again, you hurt the patient's access to the, to the physician whom she has seen. Uh, indeed, if the current reductions in, the in physician reimbursements and, and other things affecting Medicare physicians uh, continue, then Medicare reimbursement to physicians will be cut nearly in half by 2019. A recently re re released report from CMS shows these cuts are unrealistic, vir virtually certain to be overwritten by Congress, and yet on the basis of cuts like this, President Obama's health care law is touted to save money. Now, there are other mechanisms, and that is competition. Medicare Part D drug coverage did this. Because of, it included competition and cost consciousness, and because of this, the program is 40 percent below initial cost estimates. There are things better than a centrally planned economy. It is called competition. There are models where it works. We should put our faith in this and not this redux of the SGR. Uh, I will support the repeal of, President Obama, uh, of both, both of President Obama's health care law and of this provision, IPAP, as well. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, is recognized for an opening statement. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's not enough to have good intentions. Uh, we know that uh, President Obama's health care law will have 
uh, results, results that are very negative for seniors uh, and for patients uh, and for doctors in our entire health care system. Uh, indeed, the Affordable, Air, uh, Affordable Care Act will bankrupt our health care system, our Medicare system in particular, in the, within the next uh, 10 to 15 years. The math is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, today we're going to deal with a piece of legislation that will get rid of one part of that bill. Uh, we're going to try and eliminate the Independent Payment Advisory Board, a group of 15 folks uh, selected uh, unaccountably uh, that will set prices. <clears throat> We have seen in America time and time again, when the government sets prices, uh, three things happen. Uh, quality deteriorates, access goes away, uh, and prices inevitably bust through these arbitrary uh, price controls set by a centralized government. Uh, I've been here now 14 months in Congress. I've watched as we have tried to undo this uh, uh, incredible harm to our health care system, and there has not been very much cooperation from the other side of the aisle. I was very pleased today to learn that um, we've got a number of folks on this committee from the other side of the aisle who agree with us uh, that the Independent Payment Advisory Board simply doesn't work in spite of what may well have been uh, good intentions. You know, we, we, we know how to uh, make sure that seniors have an affordable, sound, reliable health care system. We have to create competition, competition at every place in the health care system, whether that's uh, physicians or drug manufacturers or uh, specialty providers and insurance companies as well. If we provide competition, we'll get what competition always leads to. Uh, we'll get more quantity, uh, much better value, effectiveness, and productivity gains through innovation that comes with companies competing. Uh, that is the direction our health care system go, and it's what IPAB prevents. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we had lots of problems in our health care system well before Obamacare was passed, but we can see how they're fixed. Uh, this House of Representatives passed a piece of legislation uh, last year to do just that with respect to Medicare. Uh, and now a, a slightly modified version that is also bipartisan with Mr. Ryan and Senator Wyden agreeing that there is a direction that will get our health care system back on the right track. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for taking up this bill. I hope that we will pass H.R. 452 and eliminate IPAB, which would eliminate so many physicians uh, that access to health care in America would be diminished for our seniors. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yeah, I would note now that uh, opening statements uh, are completed, and I would, uh, for tomorrow, uh, we will call up at H.R. 452 and ask the clerk to report the title. H.R. 452, to repeal the provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act providing for the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with. The bill will be open for amendment at any point, so ordered. So for the information of members, we are now on this bill. The committee will reconvene at 10 o'clock tomorrow. I remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow and would again note that opening statements for these three bills uh, uh, by unanimous consent can be entered into the record uh, tomorrow as well, but we're done now with the oral statements. We'll see you tomorrow at 10. Thank you. Stand adjourned.